that is lost some nights are over Sandman Mr. Sandman, bring me a dream. Make him the cutest that I've ever seen. Give him two lips like roses and clover. And tell him that his lonesome nights are over. Sandman, I'm so alone. Don't have nobody to call my own. Please turn on your magic beam. Mr. Sandman, bring me a dream. Good evening and welcome to Nox Mente. Tonight's guest is Emily Moyer from Off Planet Radio. Uh, she's an experiencer. What was a drinker of large cocktails? I forgot. No, not large cocktails. Fancy cocktails. <laughs> Fancy cocktails. <laughs> the kind with the maraschino cherries inside. Anyway. No. You've all, everybody knows. There's my volume was too high. Sorry. Everybody knows Emily. She's Randy Moggins, co-host on Off Planet Radio, and they do a a lot of great shows that the last one they had was with cliff wasn't it cliff high was a really good one that was a few back we are, we're, in, we're in the midst of a series on time with cliff high yeah there'll be, there'll be another one coming soon <clears throat> we had a few shows since that last one but yeah that was that was a biggie i don't i don't know if randy's put them up on uh, on youtube yet or i missed them it's probably the, the latter missed i missed them <laughs> anyway welcome to the show it's been so uh so long since we've talked you and i and uh, it's great to have you on the show welcome yeah, yeah. emily Absolutely. Thank you very much. It's great to reconnect with you, Jerry, and uh, really nice to meet you, Nish. So, nice we'll to see. meet you. Yeah. All right. Well, let's get rolling. Let's do it. So, um, all right. We're getting into dreams. I want to know, actually, I said I'm going to do this a little different. I'm going to start in with, like, what sign are you? Um, so I'm a cancer. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I'm a cancer with uh, Gemini rising and moon in Pisces. Oh, look uh, at that. Yeah. And um, I'm not... Like I'm not super good in astrological lingo. Like I kind of leave all that to my friend Robert. <laughs> yeah, yes. um, like I love listening to him do that stuff, but like I don't I, like so I don't know like a lot of the details of my of my you know chart and things like that. Like I know more about some of the characteristics of my sign, and you know, but I um, certainly enjoy astrology. Like I enjoy getting readings from him and doing the show. Yeah, I presume yeah. you're talking about Robert Phoenix. Robert Phoenix, yes, yes. We yeah. had him on. That was very enjoyable. Yeah. Um, so, yeah. So, but yes, I'm a Cancer and um, yeah, Gem Gemini rising, moon in Pisces. And I, there's a lot, quite a bit of Pisces, like in my chart in general. Um, yeah, a that's lot a lot of water right there in that. Yeah. I'm Gemini rising too, but with that Pisces and Cancer right there in your top three. Yeah. yeah do yeah. you feel psychic ever? Uh, yeah. I mean, I have like lots of, so I mean, I don't, yeah, I have like some, a lot of sort of psychic type experiences. Like, you know, I guess for a good portion of my life, people would say things to me like, how did you, you, how did, like, I might say something about a person, not necessarily to be critical or whatever, but because I have a feeling about them. And then years later, that would turn out to be the truth. And people would be like, how did you know? Like, that's happened to me my whole life. And then um, as I've come into like a further understanding about myself and um, my, 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 myself and my background and uh, all of my aspect selves and all that kind of stuff. I yes. recognize that I do have um, a, a degree of like an ability for future insight. I would call it maybe more that than um, being so psychic, you know what I yeah. mean? For a future insight. But I do have some of that psychic thing. I like, I'll play around sometimes like at work. If I get bored, I deal with customers all day. I'll do the, I'll play the game. Like, can I guess this person's name before they tell me kind of thing. And I, with a fairly good degree of success. Oh, that's um, excellent. But what I found interesting about, uh, what, what's more interesting to me than any of the psychic ability is a lot of times I'll ask someone their name and then in the second before they say it, I will know what they're going to say. So it's interesting. They must be sending out a signal. Yes. And I'm picking but up on it. Yeah. Is that not part of like that whole, whatever psychic is, that's just, it's just kind of like a receiver for information. Yeah. Right. 
Yeah. So like sometimes I'll freak people out because I'll ask them their name and then I'll say it before they say it. <laughs> or but, you'll get it. You'll even pick it up sometimes before they say it. Yeah, I get yeah, that. Yeah. I get that a lot. Yeah. So um, I, I, I play with that sometimes. And then like a degree of like remote viewing kind of ability, which some people yeah. might consider that to be psychic. Like it's not something I don't witchcraft. have. Like, it's witchcraft. It's, you know, <laughs> I don't have like a practice that I'm not like a disciplined remote viewer. It's more something that I will find myself suddenly looking at something and, you know, okay, this is interesting. So, I, I mean, I'm sure if I worked on it, uh, you know, more diligently, um, obviously it's, it's become obvious to me that that's something that was uh, worked on and practiced, uh, practiced, you know, in project programs, things like that, that sort of yes. outside of your complete awareness. Because uh, sometimes when I find myself looking at something like, wow, this is a really interesting thing that I'm looking at. I don't think I could have just ended up looking at this by accident. There has to be some sort of process that my mind is kind of doing all the time in the background, whether I know it or not. Yeah. Um, don't you think that um, most people remote view in a way when they think about a scenario, when they go through my what's going to happen, you know, when they try and um, just follow a path, what would happen if I did this? Like a what if scenario, when you're sure. going through that, that's a mild form of remote viewing. Yeah, there's, there's lots of different um, like techniques and styles of remote viewing, in my opinion. Some people will say there's not. Um, I, you know, like you can look at like the way that someone like Courtney Brown speaks about it, and it's a little different than the way someone like Russell Targ speaks about it, very different than the way Ingo Swan did it. Right. You know what I mean? I've talked to enough people who just practice it casually, who have different methods of doing it. Um, with me, like I will just sometimes be laying there. I will close my eyes and suddenly I'm looking at a scene and yep. Yep. okay, what am I looking at? And, uh, um, but you know, some of them are quite interesting. It, it comes mm -hmm. out of nowhere. It's not like it was something I was thinking about or whatever. It and just switches on like wow. that. It's like, boom, I'm yeah. watching a movie. I know it happens to me and it freaks me out when it first happens and then you lose it when you, when yeah. you, when you catch it that first time. Yeah. It's crazy. So yeah. Well, with um, a heavy water chart, especially, and and Jerry has a lot of water too. So I have no I, fire. I, I have more fire in my chart, but you're you have you have good water placement. Um, you, but I just expect that it's that like that. It for people that are open to it, it comes. This whatever yeah. that ability is, it's easier for people with a heavy water placement or strategic water placement. Yeah. No, I I, I agree. Um, I have a little bit of, you know, I, I'm not like, there's some people that don't have any of certain elements in their chart and I don't have that, but I definitely am much heavier on water than I am on anything else. Um, and then there's just, you know, a little bit less of each of the other elements. Um, yeah. yeah, no, I think the water, um, water is really, really interesting. Like water, how it's attached to, um, memory and yes. how water is a, a, you know, very much a portal. Um, and, um, it, do we actually are we actually water beings? Like, do we really actually come from the water as opposed to evolving from apes or, you know what I mean? So, yes. um, yeah. So I think the water is really interesting. I mean, it's one of the things that Randy and I have um, dipped into a little bit and we're going to really start expand, expanding and expounding on this year on the show for sure is um, the, our strong feeling that there are oceans both above and below us. And yes. that the, uh, <laughs> the way that you get to quote unquote space is through water and it basically through water acts as like a portal or a doorway. Yes. The inner worlds to the outer worlds. Uh, our bodies are made mostly of water and there is an entire universe inside of us that uh, is much, much more important than the one that they insist exists outside of us. If you could see so the goosebumps this. I have yeah, right now. Same here, Jerry. <laughs> so I've always felt this. And then the more people are talking about this now, the more it's, it's just, it is, uh, yes. All I've got to say about that is yes. And let's get into that in the after show. Sure. Let, me, let me add one correlating data point beside these goosebumps. Um, it, it occurs to me, it looks to me as if the NASA launches from Cape Canaveral are kind of like arc into the ocean somewhere. Right. Yeah. So that would make <laughs> sense out there that there's either a, a rocket yeah. graveyard or a portal. Right. Yeah. yeah. I, I'm not sure. I, I think in that, in that, a Stargate, case, whatever. I, think it's a, I think those rockets are probably going to just a gra grave in the ocean. I don't think, I think that they're. I don't think that those rockets are then going into the water and going into a portal, although they could be. But if you know, the number of people who have seen craft come out of the water, um, if large. craft can yeah. go out, then they also can go in. So, yeah. So, 
for sure. All right. I'm sorry. So, oh, so let's get into some of your, um, let's get, so let's come back and get back into <laughs> your, um, the stuff that influenced you as a very young person. So let's try to keep it like before three and yep. stuff that sticks out, maybe symbols or important events, pots and dreams. If you have them get paint us a picture of your very early life. So um, I was born in Los Angeles, California. And um, so my early life, uh, but I be, but all before the age of three, I, um, well, first of all, people find this funny, but I was born with a full head of hair, hair down to my shoulders. Two oh, my God. My parents expecting a boy. Um, <laughs> yeah. So, and, yeah. And then there's also, uh, like, my mother had an unusual um, an operation when she was pregnant with me that nobody can quite understand why they would do that when someone's pregnant and that she had one of her ovaries removed while she was pregnant with me. So oh, that's that interesting. Actually, what was really going on. And then while, while she was in the hospital for that procedure, if you ask my mother, which this is fascinating as well, if you ask my mother, she was sharing the room with Jodie Foster's sister, who was having some kind of late-term abortion. But if you ask my father, and my over mother, retransplant, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, probably or something like her. that. And if you ask my father, my mother was sharing the room with Jodie Foster, which begs the question: Why would Jodie Foster need to share a room with somebody in the hospital? Jodie right? Foster's so, not that old. Right. Yeah. No. She's well. She's about ten, eight, eight she's or ten my years age. older. She's fifty something. Fifty five. Yeah, I'm. I'm forty two. She's okay. like eight or ten years older, or something like that. So, but still, um, it's L. A. And and people in the business are everywhere, and people that don't haven't had LA experiences don't understand that. Sure. So, and if, yeah, absolutely. And of course, um, I was born at um, Cedars of Lebanon Hospital, which um, is now uh, the same building is now occupied by the Church of Scientology. And the Cedars of Lebanon relocated and renamed itself and is now known as Cedar Sinai, which is where they send all the celebrities for their reprogram. Interesting. Right? <laughs> There's <laughs> probably a tunnel between <laughs> the two. <laughs> yeah. And, um, so that so that's my, my pre-birth kind of situation, and then uh, very early, uh, about the age of two, I started doing Hollywood stuff. Which I'm not still 100 percent clear on why. Um, the best story I can give my parents is that it was recommended that I that they get me an agent and you know mm -hmm. put me in, in the business, and so mm -hmm. I did do some of that. Um, I was in uh, a movie called Rainbow about Judy Garland's life, which is where I always say that I received my first dose of Wizard of Oz programming. Oh yeah, and, that's the one uh, with all the um, with all the midgets, right? Wizard of Oz is the one with the midgets. No, I know, but in the Rainbow movie, they had they had interviews with them, well, didn't they? I remember that. Rainbow yeah, Ra Rainbow was basically like it was a made for television. I guess it was made for television movie that was a dramatization of Judy Garland's life. Oh, what okay. I'm, there's, I'm thinking yeah. of something else. Sorry, there was another yeah. dramatization of the the Munchkins' life. Okay, with, yeah. With those that same kind of thing during. The yeah, I think that one was called Under the Rainbow. Got it. Yes. Yeah. Okay, that's yeah. what I'm thinking of. I was yeah. in a movie called Rainbow that was basically you know this you know with the song Rainbow from Wizard of Oz and and whatnot. So I'm like in the very opening part of that movie as as playing Judy Garland as a child, and then I was in another um I was in another movie called He Wants Her Back. You know that a, that gives you a rainbow connection. I have a rainbow connection for sure. The lovers, the dreamers, and me. No, but I think it, it, it's very, um, to me, that explains why I was put into Hollywood because that was there for that kind of, it's, that's how they do it. That's how the programming starts. And I definitely have a degree of rainbow programming, bluebird programming, all of that kind of stuff that, that is Wizard of Oz, just like Alice in Wonderland and some of these others, it's a type of programming. And yes. that's, that's where it started for me. I mean, I think it started pre-birth, but that was like really the first conscious memories I had of, of it's like I remember being on the set there and, and things like that. Um, I was in another movie, actually, I think before, before called He Wants Her Back, which is a movie made for um, PB, a PBS, PB, you know, for PBS's Visions series. Um, and it was called He Wants Her Back, which I think is a really weird name. Um, but uh, that one's like almost impossible to find. Like, you said, like I, I, that, that's not on YouTube or anything like that. And I was in like a few other little things. Um, but, you know, uh, shortly by the age of two, I also had started doing gymnastics, um, which was something I was more, was more like that. I know why I was doing that. My parents put me in it because I was hyper. I still am. But I love gymnastics. Like I don't... <laughs> <laughs> denying the fact that I'm hyper. Um, 
But uh, so I started doing gymnastics, which was something that I was much more personally interested in. But that mm -hmm. also led to some other roles that would use gymnastics ability that I have different roles. You know, I did um, I would go on like these morning talk shows and things like that and, and do little gymnastics exhibitions and uh, things like that, like good, morning, good Day LA and Good Morning, you know, that kind of stuff. Yes. Later on, later in my gymnastics, later on, I did some stunt doubling more as an adult. Um, but mostly I would say that my life as a child, I spent a lot of time with both my father and my grandparents. My mother um, went back to work really early and I spent a larger amount of time with my father and my grandparents. And then my parents separated when I was fairly young, like six. Mm -hmm. And I stayed living with my father. So my father's, you know, I'd say that the things have been the hugest influence in my young life were definitely the Hollywood experiences, but I didn't understand that then. Only now yeah. in, in hindsight do I understand that. The gymnastics has, was the major shaping thing of my life, both young, at youngster and teenage years, and then even into early adulthood and, and adulthood. And it's still, I still, um, I, I don't coach gymnastics anymore. I did for a long time, but um, I still really enjoy following gymnastics. And I go to a lot of UCLA gymnastics meets and all that kind of did stuff. You, did you, um, were you heavily affected by the divorce at all? So I was the first, I was pretty much the first kid that I knew. I think I knew one other kid at my school who had divorced parents. So mm -hmm. this is back in like the late seventies, early eighties. Yeah. It's latchkey period. Yeah. So I, I was, um, it was, I, I've always been like, um, one of those people who's kind of like ahead of it. Like I, I usually do things before other people do them. And so mm -hmm. the divorce thing, I, I was the first kid, like I knew one other kid that had divorced parents at that age. And then I was the first kid that I knew that the parents got divorced and they stayed living with the father. Um, so was it like a, was it a shame thing or was it like from other, were you getting pressure or like a, were you getting weird vibes from people no, in any I mean, way? Like there or was some, There was some like kids at school whose parents didn't want them to come over and play at our house because there wasn't a female there. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like that kind yeah. of stuff. But I was extremely busy as a child. I mean, pretty much my life, my early childhood consisted of, going to school and then after school going to an audition and then going to gymnastics. I've started doing gymnastics um, five, like when I was two. By the time I was about six or seven years old, I was going like about five hours a day, five days a week. Yeah, uh, that's like pro style, yeah. I was training at a pretty high level and, um, you know, I did, uh, my dad was, you know, my, my mom was around, she was in my life, but she, we, we just basically saw her on weekends. Maybe she'd pick me up from the gym one time during the week. So my dad was doing a lot of schlepping back and forth and, we had, you know, there was people helping us because he was a single parent also working full time. Um, and so I just remember, you know, it's so interesting because sometimes what it felt like then and then what you understand about it now in hindsight and retrospect, I just remember being busy all the time, not really getting too many chances to do the things the other kids were doing other than the kids I did gymnastics with. Yeah. You know? um, and being tired all the time because, uh, which is interesting since we're going to, you know, talk about what happens at night here. Um, yes. I, I was, you know, work, I was going to school. I was a very good student. I was doing the Hollywood thing. The Hollywood thing stopped at about seven or eight because I just wasn't interested. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like they, 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 it was a obvious I wasn't really interested. Yeah. Um, but then with the gymnastics, I loved the gymnastics and I was good at it and whatnot. But I would not get home from school until like, I mean, from work, if I'd work out until like 930, sometimes later than that. And I was never not a good sleeper. I was never a good sleeper. And so I, you know, and from a very young age, I was having trouble waking up in the morning. I was falling asleep in class. Fortunately, I was a good student, but most people don't start getting notes home from their teachers that the, the you know, the kids are falling asleep in class until they're in junior high or high school. I started getting them in like fourth grade. <laughs> Did you, were you in this early period, do you remember any, any dreams or nightmares at all that still are with you? So, yeah. So, um. Okay, so the only like real, I mean, I had like your usual kinds of dreams that kids have, like some flying dreams. And I had a lot of underwater dreams that I have certain understandings about now. Um, but, a lot of people, Emily, don't have those. So you yeah. say that all cavalier like, but it's those are kind of uncommon for some people. Lisa Harrison yeah. brought this up this week. Uh, but, okay, um, yeah. So I, there's but, more to that. We'll talk, I'm writing it down. We're going to talk about that. Yeah, yeah. That's after sure. show stuff. Yeah. Um, and so I, I, the one vivid memory I have was when I was about three, I had a broken wrist and I had broken my wrist on the school playground. And, um, I was taking a, I, I had a cast on my arm and I was taking a nap, I guess, like in my dad's bedroom, we were both taking a nap and, um, I was having a dream that somebody was chasing me and I was trying to hit them. 
I was hitting my dad in the face with my cast <laughs> in the bed, right? Because he was laying kind of oh, next wow. to me. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Um, but so that's like one I remember. But mostly I remember um, being terrified to go to sleep, not wanting to go to sleep, make, waking up many times during the night, uh, always wanting like wanting to sleep with my parents. Um, and then from the from the age I was old enough to understand what it was, sleep paralysis, a lot Ooh. of sleep. And a lot I, of that. A lot of it, and like I've spoke, I've done a lot of research on sleep paralysis, and spoken to a lot of people about it. I have not met anyone yet that has had the level of sleep paralysis that I had. Give um, me, give me, please give me an example of some of the more severe or scary times. <laughs> of sleep paralysis. So, it, like, I, I, so I think I was having it from in the womb, which is I think why I never wanted to sleep. Um, but. I think I probably started to recognize what it was and understand what it was, like maybe around six or, you know, like, like probably younger than that. But the first time I understood like, oh, I can't move. You know what I mean? Like when you're a little, like I, the first time I really understood it was probably somewhere in the six to eight range. Mm -hmm. And what it would just be um, was like, it would happen generally when I was falling asleep, you know, or when I'm waking up, that's when it tends to happen. Right. Um, and it would basically be, I would become aware of the fact that I was awake, but that I could not move, that I could hear everything going on around me. And I could see a little bit. It was like trying to see, like, you know, when you close your eyes, like almost all the way, you can just see through your eyelashes. Yes. I could see the room like that. I could hear everything going on. And I it felt like I weighed a million pounds. And sometimes it felt like there was a presence moving towards me. Ooh. Like, I can't say I ever saw anything. Like maybe other than maybe a shadow, but, um, but you were it was a feeling you were not alone. It was a feeling that I wasn't alone, and, and the, the presence was coming towards me, and that uh, I couldn't move, and that while I could hear myself breathing, I it felt like I couldn't breathe, and um, so uh, it, and that would happen like at night as falling asleep, and in the morning when waking up, and that's pretty much I've had it for most of my life. The last few, I'd say. Um, three to five years, it's been a lot less. And I think I credit that a lot to uh, some of the deprogramming process for myself and for just the becoming kind of aware of it. And then also making certain changes in my life to sort of help with that. But it still happens occasionally. Now, I haven't had any of the, um, oh, the other thing that would be strange about it sometimes is as I got older, I didn't want and was still afraid to sleep and not wanting to sleep. I would sleep with the TV on. So mm -hmm. sometimes what the, the, what's going on in the TV would become intertwined with A, yes. dreams, and B, what was going on in this waking up or falling asleep process where I was paralyzed, which was kind of weird and interesting. Um, so, yeah, like I, I actually, like, you know, I think that my fear to sleep started from in the womb or as a very small child, but not knowing what it was, it just became a fear to sleep. I didn't understand that it was because of the paralysis. I didn't really realize it's the fear of sleep the fear to sleep had anything to do with the paralysis until I was an adult. But I think that's what I remember. I remember the sleep paralysis from before then, but I didn't, was, I didn't make the connection as to that was why I didn't want to go to bed. Um, yeah. As I've also obviously gotten older and come to terms with some things about my life, I recognize that it's entirely possible that I was being taken out of my, out of my house or out of my body yes. um, for, for, you know, tasks, missions, training, things like that. And that would be a perfect, I mean, if a kid had any, um, even if it was way back in their subconscious or just stored in their body, uh, knowledge of that, that would be a perfect reason why they would never want to go to sleep. Um, Do you, so, okay, and honing back in on this, and especially yeah. when this started, the, it, it, around the divorce, actually, right, well, is kind of what you're when, saying, when I, seven. When I, when I, had aware, I think that was when I was like, oh, I, get, I, I can't move. I, like, I think it was happening before that. I think it was always happening. But, but that's I, when you seem to remember it most starting. But, yeah, that's when I became, like, I think that was when I had I understood what it meant to be unable to move. Yeah. Yeah. Do you, have you, so is it, do you feel like you miss out on stuff? That, like, if you're not around, you're missing out on stuff? And so I'm trying to, I'm tying this into the sleep yeah. paralysis. Yeah, no, so I definitely, like, um, when I was a kid, like, I always was, like, wondering what the adults were doing downstairs. Yeah. Um, I, like, I, I got, I liked, like, much more sophisticated television programming than most kids my age did. So I, like, at a certain point age, I didn't want to miss something that was on the TV. But I also had, like, a super hyper, um, hyper, uh, like, um, hearing awareness. 
Like I could, we had a huge house and I would be up in the top left-hand corner of the house on the top of my bunk bed. And I could literally hear every single word of the conversation that was going on. Like, oh, wow. Upstairs and you know what I mean? Like, with the, yeah. like, you know, and I don't know, like, so I would be like interested to try and listen in on you know what I mean? And I actually think I was already doing some like remote viewing kind of stuff. I was, I was That's listening. exactly oh, what I was thinking. Like, you're, you're psychically yeah. honing in on stuff. Yeah. Um, I, like I remember one time I was almost asleep, like I, you know, when you're just almost, almost there. And then I heard yes. my name said, and I flipped out. <laughs> like I jumped out and went running downstairs. Like, Why are you talking about me? And uh, this is from across the house and down. This is like yeah. a great distance. Yeah. 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 That's, um, yeah, you, you're very sensitive. Okay. So I want to get into, in, in this last, um, grouping before I move into the current dream stuff, have yeah. you done any psychedelics? Yes. And so just in brief, like anything that was um, significant that may have changed the landscape for you or tuned you into stuff you weren't aware of before some of the, give us the spiritual juicy stuff. Sure. So I was a little late to start with like any of the psychedelics or drug taking or anything like that because of my involvement with gymnastics. So I didn't ever experiment with anything until I was already in my twenties. Yeah. Um, which I think in some ways was really good because my brain, like I see like my stepbrother started taking psychedelics when he was really young and he had that wandered off look in his eye. You know what I mean? Yes. I think that, like, it was <laughs> I do. advantage for me to not, you know, like I think the first time I took any serious psychedelics was in my mid twenties. Um, and it was ecstasy. And then shortly thereafter, LSD and then mushrooms. And, um, you know, I've tried some of the other unusual designer ones. Um, but one of the things that I, recognized i didn't again i didn't understand it as this at, at the moment now i do in hindsight but they felt like home immediately and i think part of that is because they were you they used psychedelics on us as children in the programs mm -hmm. so it was a very familiar space and landscape and um ecstasy was the first one i did and that was probably like at the time i thought that was really interesting but over, like overall it was least interesting and and not not my favorite and not something i you know i, I would do it at parties like, for a little while and then because i was into rave scene and dance music yeah, yeah. whatever um but I, it made me want to sit down and not dance and i like to dance um i remember i think the first time i did acid was probably i was like 25 um about, yeah and um if, and it was very interesting i loved the psychoanalytical aspects of it um, and then really loved the uh, self-observation and then the zooming it out to observing yourself, observing yourself. And um, I was really into like, break dancing at the time and popping. And, you know, I was like going to a lot of parties and I was like one of the most interesting experiences that I ever had was watching myself dance in the circle. Like, break oh, nice. Dance. So you were actually bilocated out of your body. Yeah. Like nice. I was standing on the side of the circle watching myself break dance. And then all of a sudden, like I was back in my body on the outside of the circle and people were looking at me and clapping and I didn't understand what was going on. Um, you oh, know, wow. so that was interesting. And like, I also started doing really like for me, the combination of the psychedelics and at this point we're talking about acid, but I will get a little bit more into the mushrooms later. I, and so with acid, I, I appreciated like the super psychoanalytical process you could get into. And that combined with the repetitive nature of dance music and particularly the dance music I prefer, which is techno or house. So it's got a 4-4 mm -hmm. four, four beat. It created like this rhythm that allowed me to like really work through things that I was the kind of person who had a lot of trouble talking about my issues and my problems and whatever. But I'm telling you, like eight or 10 hours on the dance floor and with like the whole kind of lose yourself in, the, in your own mind kind of thing, I was mm -hmm. starting to get into, I was starting to like, understand the multi-dimensional nature of my own self yes um and uh all of the workings of my own mind and um past lives and future selves and all of this kind of thing and also starting to be able to um see myself the way other people saw me right? oh yeah that's important yeah and so that was really really um interesting i remember i used to <laughs> people always laugh about this but sometimes in the, I, in the car on the way home from a party in the morning I'd call my therapist and tell her all of the things that I, all the realizations I had had. And then when I saw her the next week, she'd be like, you were thinking about that while you were at a party. <laughs> and it's just like, yeah, everybody else is just like having a good time and I'm doing like deep inner psychic work yes. on myself. And, I, and to this day, I continue to love dance music and I continue to use it for self-exploration. I mean, oh, absolutely. Dance will take you right into another state for yeah, sure. I mean, 
if people, especially now with the shit that I'm into and the shit that I'm talking about and whatever, if anybody else in the room at the party that I, parties that I go to had any idea what I was thinking about or what I was doing in my mind, <laughs> it would be, you know, I, I just, I can't, it's, it's, I'm sure I'm doing something totally different than what they're doing. I mean, they may be doing psychic inner work or whatever, but at this point, like I'm completely analyzing everything that's going on energetically in the room and yes. I have lots of ideas about um, the common, you know, how sound and light has been used as a programming weapon, even though we also enjoy, it can be used for wonderful, amazing healing things. But at this point, it's obviously being used to do all sorts of nefarious things with certain kinds of frequencies. Um, there is so much weird stuff that goes on in the underground. And some of it is just the nature of the underground, but it also yes. makes it a perfect place to um, something is perfect thing to infiltrate and experiment with psychotronic weaponry, different kinds of designer drugs, uh, application of certain kinds of sound and light frequencies. Um, yeah, uh, you name it. It's uh, in my opinion, it's going on there. So, well, and because you've had these experiences firsthand, you're able to pinpoint and and actually sew a larger picture for people that have not. Right. Yeah. Because this yeah. is firsthand experience when you're opening yourself up through the psychedelic experience. Yeah, it's um, it's it's I mean, it's almost hard to describe, but you recognize these patterns that can be used against us. Yeah. Like one of the things I've come to. So in the last 10, 15 years, the only psychedelic I really engaged in has been mushrooms. It's, my, it's the one I've always preferred. I mean, yeah. I, didn't do, I didn't experiment with it till after acid. And once I kind of found mushrooms, I was kind of done with the rest of them. Yeah. And um, it really felt like, uh, it feels like home. Like I was listening to you guys at your show that you did with Robert. And he was talking about how like the mushrooms are almost like a friend or like a warm space or yes. and definitely, even though sometimes I had some extremely intense, sometimes even almost borderline scary experiences and not scary because anything dangerous, scary because of how close it brought me to like a peek into the other side sometimes or into a deep, a very deep part of myself that might seem like the other side. Mm -hmm. um, but the something about the visuals with psilocybin, that, that landscape, the color, the geometry, um, all of that kind of stuff, it felt to me immediately like that was what I come from. Like that was, yeah. that was home for me. Um, and it became, I really started to use it to explore my own boundaries of perception, to experiment with pushing through the other side, um, and to, uh, to really f almost create a, a connection, a doorway, a stargate between myself here now, my original self that I was in the first time around, and the highest self in the future that I'm trying to get to, yes. and really open up like a line of communication between the, those various uh, versions of myself. I love the imagery that it evokes too. It's, <laughs> um, and I can, I can personally relate to it. Mushrooms are a beautiful thing. Yeah. I, I also haven't done any, any psychedelics in a long time. I'm actually a little bit afraid <laughs> at this yeah. point with I everything can, I know. You know, I took a long break from them because at a certain point in my uh, journey and my level of the uh, rising level of self awareness and my deprogramming, I began to be concerned that the psychedelics were be part were somehow contributing to some sort of programming or AI, yeah. uh, almost like an AI program that I thought was being possibly run on me, and I still think may have been. Um, but I, I think it was like I don't think it was. Um, I needed to take. I need to take a step to take a step back to sort of clarify my mind and and really sort of separate what was what. Yes. And uh, only in the last year have I had any experiences with psychedelics again. I took a couple of years away, and I have a much. Um, I, it's not as confusing as it had gotten for a while. For a while, it was literally like. Uh, so I was having this weird thing happen where, like, I would have these incredible like geometric, um, like, like. The landscapes in front of myself and sometimes it would be like I would just go through the geometry and end up somewhere else like I have traveled through geometric grids and and, and ended up basically viewing ancient Egypt and things like that but then yes. sometimes I would just end up almost in this like for lack of a better word and I don't mean this in any kind of r like romantic way like seductive dance with some of these ge geometries that felt to me like there was maybe some sort of consciousness or entity behind it yes gyrating Right. And sometimes it was okay, but some of them felt unusual to me. And that was where I started to think that there may have been something, you know, whether this 
was something that was just hearkening back to earlier programming or whether, you know, because I'm in this underground dance environment, like can the, some of the things they're experimenting with be affecting the, my own personal psychedelic experience. And it began to feel like, you know, I, I loved it, but it was almost like I was a little bit losing myself in it. You know what I mean? And it, like, like it may be a little more than one should. Um, and then I was doing, having this thing where like I would see these incredible, like, landscapes like geometries um, mandalas fractals different kinds of like stuff and I would want to see them again and so I don't even know how I got into doing this but I got into I found this website called deviant art yeah and yes I would oftentimes when I would get home from parties I would spend hours on deviant art looking to see if I could find something that looked similar to what I saw on the back of my eyelids while I was dancing right mm -hmm. and Usually, not only would I find something that looked like it, I would often find the very thing I had been looking at. And the interesting part was that it usually had been posted during the period of time that I was at the party. Oh, so now this first, is intriguing. Yeah. So at first I thought, oh, that's, I, I didn't know what it was at first. Like I thought, oh, that's kind of cool. And then as I, you know, and this, this, I've been doing this for years and years. So I like, you know, my level of awareness of different things going on in the world, as it rose, I started to have. I guess one could say some paranoia, but others would just say awareness yeah. uh, about what this could be. And at first I thought, oh, that's just synchronicity. Like maybe I was like a receptor and I was picking, somebody was making this art and I was somehow perceiving it because I can remote view. Or maybe I was creating this in my mind and sending it out to someone else who was picking it up. And I think that some of that is possible. Like I don't want to be one of these people and I refuse to be one of these people who like hands over all of the incredible powers humans have and says, oh, it's all because of programming. I right, right. I don't absolutely. Think that's true. I think that like they know that humans can do this and so they try and manipulate it. But at a certain point it did dawn on me that it's entirely possible that like that there could be some kind of AI wound in with some of these kinds of websites. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? And, you know, I don't, and, and with myself, you know what I mean? Like, we all know that there doesn't have to be a chip or anything like that for there to be entrainment anymore. Right. Oh, you yeah. Know? And I would, um, you know, I, I got, it, got, it got to the point where, like, I wouldn't even necessarily have to go looking for these things. They would just start popping up. Like, I could go to the DeviantArt website, whether I, either just after a party or just any other time. Because once I sort of understood I had this symbiotic relationship with it, I kind of was interested. I'd go to the website. I wouldn't type anything in. I would just think about something. And then those pieces of art with that title of the thing I was thinking about would start to come up. That's or, a perfect exercise to perform really at any time. Yeah. You know what I mean? So I, I, you know, but also understanding And at this point I was not, um, I was still engaging in a lot of uh, self-destructive behaviors that people who have been through some of the things I've been through do. And also just humans in general sometimes do because life is hard. Um, but when you're in that space where you know something weird has been, has gone on with you, but you're not talking about it yet and you're doing self-destructive behaviors, that's when you're at the most risk. And that's also when the most pressure is being applied to you because they, they you know what I mean? They, okay. If you come out and start talking about it, you might seem crazy, especially if you're doing self-destructive behaviors. So you mm -hmm. can't really talk about it. So you're kind of in this like hell, somewhat of your own creation, but you know, not completely. Um, and it was just like somewhat of a scary time, but it was also like, probably the period of time where I understood the most about how this, what, whatever the fuck we're going to call this thing, or excuse my language, we're in, whatever this containment system is, this, whatever this simulation is, whatever mm -hmm. kinds of um, really interesting abilities that humans have that are being tapped into, manipulated, expanded, you know, accelerated, all that kind of stuff. Like my awareness was so high and it really um, opened me up and really was part of making the creative out there kind of thinker I am today. So while some of those experiences were scary, challenging, and difficult, I'm very glad I had them. Um, well, those and, and those, just, just to tap on this before we move forward. Some of them were also the, beautiful, by the way. Yeah, some of them were also amazing. Yeah. When you're in that space where maybe you're out of control a little bit with whatever is going on in your life, this is oftentimes when the genesis of change happens, right? Before the egg cracks, right? Yeah. And you're, you're, you're a new into something new, a bigger world. And so the, it's an important thing. Nothing comes easily. I find that's, that's, um, I hate to say it's a cliche, but it's really true. Um, yeah. So with these psychedelic experiences and this internal stuff that you experienced through them, ha has the dreamscape 
at all had anything that was congruent with them? Is there, is there some similarities? So it's not really. And I'll say this, like, it's very, um, the last thing I want to say before about psychedelics real quick before we move on is that yeah. uh, in my, this is Emily here. I am who I am now. I have never done um, DMT or ayahuasca. Yeah. Um, but when they first, when it first started becoming like talked about more and I was listening to people's reports and then of course listening to some of the things like people like Terrence McKenna had to say about it, but I was listening to people describe their trips. I was I like, love oh, Terrence. I've already done that. Yes. So <laughs> I think that like that, to me, like I think that was heavily used on, on, on kids and programs um, because every, like even some of the weirdest ones I've heard experienced, I'm like, oh, I totally, I totally know that. Like I totally get that. Yeah. Um, so I think that like that's, um, and I do have some level of concern with how popular ayahuasca has been, has become Absolutely. Yep. that it, this is being used as a massive mind control uh, mm -hmm. tool. Not that I think the um, ayahuasca itself is mind control. I think that in this frequency soup we've lived, we live in, they have figured out a way to like, basically if your body achieves a certain frequency, there'll be a frequency out there in the atmosphere waiting for you to hit it. And it will yeah. influence your psychedelic experience. And I think that's happening with I particularly with ayahuasca. Um, uh, and you've seen some very strange things happen with people who do a lot of it and whatnot. So I don't ever say people shouldn't do any of these things, but just be aware now that like, it's almost impossible to have a purely organic experience anymore. So we just need to understand that. Um, and also, uh, uh, I just lost my train of thought. <laughs> oh. I, I want to chime in on that. It, it's, yeah. um, I agree with you. And one of the reasons why it's been a very long time since I did LSD and I did quite a bit of it. Um, but there was a point where I felt as if, it was, there was something already waiting. Like it was, yeah. that was going to take control of the experience and it became, and then it became a bad trip after bed. I don't need to do too many bad things before I'm like, ah, I'm out. Yeah. No, <laughs> so I, I'm not one of those people that continues to like get her head hit. I, I agree with you. And I think, I think that can be said for all of the psychedelics. I think it's a little different with the ones that are quote unquote organic. Yeah. Um, oh, is, definitely. I definitely think that like with drugs like LSD, M ecstasy, crystal meth, any of these laboratory produced drugs, um, we can, we can get into this a little bit more in the after show because we were going to talk about some of the programmable matter things. These are not only programmable matter, they are programmed matter. And I think that it's gone from like in the sixties where they used, they would use these drugs on people and then do mind control practices, techniques, experiments on them. I yes. think it's moved from that to where the mind control experience is now written into the drug. The MKL yeah. is in the acid now. They don't take acid and put you under MKL tray. It's actually in the, in the drug. Now. Yeah. That's what I've tried to describe <laughs> that to people. It's difficult, but there is yeah. a, there's a definite difference. And I was having that experience with the organics too, where all of a sudden I felt like it was like walking through a door and they were already expecting you. Well, I think like that, I mean, Terrence McKenna has talked about that, how they'd be waiting for him. Like, oh, it's been so long yeah. since you've been here. So I definitely yeah. think there is some of that. There's definitely a consciousness in the organic. Um, I think in the organic ones, it, it feels like a more organic consciousness than whatever's waiting for you with some of the more synthetic drugs. But I'll also say this. I think we are in some kind of um, simulation by, or bi biological containment system. And I think that psychedelics, the entheogens, um, things like ayahuasca, psilocybin, Mm -hmm. um, peyote, whatever. I think these were the, um, yeah, these are the original, the original, the technology of the original biological system. They're a biological, they're like the inter, they were like the original internet, right? Yeah, are you, yeah, absolutely. Are you familiar with Paul Stamets's work on uh, mycology and mycelium? I've heard, I heard like a small clip of him on the Joe Rogan podcast and I've been meaning to go back and listen to the rest of it. Go back and yeah. listen to the rest because that consciousness he would argue is mushroom. Yeah, no, yeah. I, I I think that the, I mean, you can even listen to, and I've said this many times, you look, like listen to some of the things that Steve Wozniak, Steve Jobs, and other people who were uh, part of creating the early computers and the early, really useful aspects of the internet, they said that they were doing a lot of psychedelics at the time and that they modeled the way it works after the way that the mushrooms and the vines like grow and hub and cluster and stuff underground. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, it's Modeled it's what? That doesn't make any sense. Modeled, 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 modeled the internet. Oh, the in well, they didn't work on the internet. 
Well, they, they were they, they they were doing early computers, and so they were creating computers that would be useful and response responsive to the way that the and I know the internet came from you know the ARPANET, the mm -hmm. ARPA, whatever, and also there's the certain connections to what what was now CERN and things like that. <laughs> but the way the way that the internet actually works with like servers and hubs and things like that mm -hmm. is actually very similar to the way that. The vines and mushrooms and stuff when they're growing underground they'll hub and cluster in the areas where there is water gotcha I got right it. and yeah. they network I out yeah. I, I was thinking in the hardware that they put this into their chips but they're you know never mind gotcha so. yeah okay so let's get into the dream the actual dream portion now that we're an hour in this is going to be a late show guys um mm -hmm. <laughs> i love it but you knew that <laughs> Yes, I did. Well, I, they're come, we're we're flowing with that nowadays. We were trying to keep them at an hour, but I think it it's almost yeah. impossible. Let it go where it takes you. Yeah, yeah, we're not control freaks. But, um, so tell us about your dream experience, the dream landscape that you have, and 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 mostly from the contemporary point where you are now. Okay, real quickly, just for a second, because I, I I I got a little distracted and I didn't completely answer your prior question. One of the things, why I would say that there wasn't so much crossover between the psychedelic state and the dream state is because I was a terrible sleeper. And yes. also, like, I don't have, um, I don't have, I, I have an incredible memory for my waking hours, but I struggle more than most people to remember my dreams. I sometimes can do it, but I also had a really, really long period of my life where it was blackout at night for me I, like I don't like I for I, at least there was periods of years in my life where I don't remember a single dream where and, and it didn't feel like I was dreaming when I, it was you know now you know sometimes you wake up and you can hold on to it for a second but then you can't remember it this wasn't right. that it was just like blackout at night which I don't know exactly what that was and then at a certain point also becoming aware of there was something else funny going on at night um you know, so we can get into them. But so that was why when I, you asked if there was any crossover, like I don't really know because I struggle with the dream state. I mean, I struggle with sleep. And so I don't think I have the same amount of hours of dream time that other people have. Um, and uh, also I dream in, mostly in black and white or shades of gray. And my psychedelic experiences are so colorful. Um, so oh, okay, that's, a, that's pretty significant. That, that's, a, that's a chasm. <laughs> My dream state is more is a lot more like my remote viewing state, which is generally uh -huh. mostly in monotone grayscale. Mm -hmm. gray Sometimes there'll be a little bit of something with a, some other kind of color to it, but but it's very very dull, and usually just in black and white or shades of gray. Um, so yeah, so the modern dream state it's been it's actually like the last couple years um, since I've really been doing a good job with like actively like deprogramming and. And kind of being hyper aware of my my state of mind at all times. I am having more um, dreams that I'm able to hang on to, um, but it seem it's it's such a weird thing. Sometimes it feels like that's reality and this is a dream, and like there's certain yes. like um, you know like I can be somewhere. And actually, a friend was talking about this to me the other day. And she described I didn't understand what she was talking about the way she first described it because she said she was like having a dream of being in New York, but it was her New York, which is different than the regular New York. Yeah. So I kind of didn't understand that at first. But then, I understand that. Right. And then the other night I had a dream where I was like, oh, now I, okay, this is how, I, I know what she's talking about. Like in my um, dream world, there is areas of, like I can be like, in an, I can know what area I am in, in relation to like the Los Angeles in the real world or wherever, but there's certain parts or pockets of it that are different. Um, yes. You know what I mean? Like, and I, like sometimes, but sometimes I can like, I also wonder if some of these dreams are really dreams because I have some of that also in terms of uh, memory bleed through from mm -hmm. certain periods of my life where I would actually spend time in my waking hours, my conscious waking hours, looking for things, looking for places that I don't know. I just knew they existed, but I had no idea where they were. But I thought I sort of knew where, like, you know what I mean? Like, I, I remember particularly one period of time in my life when I was living in Austin. Like, I had memories of being certain places, but I could not find them in my waking hours. Um, I, 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 they weren't from my dream. Like, I didn't, they weren't, it didn't feel like it was from dreams. It felt like maybe this was places that I was going on nighttime missions, nighttime tasks mm -hmm. or whatever. And I've gotten some confirmation of that uh, in recent years. But sometimes this need to find them would become so strong that I'd also start looking for them in my dreams. 
to try and figure out because sometimes I wonder if there isn't just like, um, like, like there's like almost hidden pockets in, in our landscape in our reality landscape. There are hidden pockets that you only have access to under certain states of consciousness. And maybe when you're on an altar or on task, that is the state of consciousness that sort of opens up kind of like portals that are right there in front of you all of the time, but you can't sort of vibrate to go through them in your normal consciousness. <clears throat> Does that make any sense? I can't hear anybody. Yeah, completely. Okay. I, yeah. I'm 100% there with that. Yeah. I was digesting, um, sorry. <laughs> the information. Yeah. So, um, yeah. So I do, you know, I, I, uh, I also like sometimes, I, like, I feel like some things that I, other people describe as dreams sound like memories that I have. Right. Um, and so I sometimes wonder what dreams actually are. And especially like now in the last couple of years, I feel like a lot of things, a lot of memories from, uh, the lost years for myself are being returned to me in my dreams. Mm -hmm. um, so there's that, you know, there's that. And then of course there's the class of dreams that I would consider for lack of a better term and uh, like trips to the cloning centers or what I'll, what I'll, there's another thing that I call inserted dreams or 5G mm -hmm. dreams. Mm -hmm. And these are the dreams one has if they forget to unplug the router before they go to sleep. Right. Which are completely, they feel inserted and synthetic and, um, like weird, like almost like um, like a broadcast. You know what I mean? How do you navigate between? So this kind of pushes us into what are dreams? How do you view what? it all? And so there's these yeah. categories, and how do you nav navigate between these um, categories, these rooms in this house? Yeah. So I, I what, one of the things. So I think occasionally now I do have like what are considered like normal dreams if that if there is such a thing like because maybe we can go well, we there. understand what that context yeah, is right so okay so i have some of those now which i didn't have for many many years so and then when i have a dream that is like a memory the thing with it is it usually comes with like it isn't usually isolated like, it usually can be like some like uh those period of day, periods of days before or after have been like somewhat stressful and not but not necessarily in a bad way um and there tends to be physical sensation um m not always necessarily with the dream but like maybe the next day some kind of unusual sense but sometimes with the dream um uh like um uh elisa e my friend elisa e has an interesting uh, term that she uses for some of this stuff that i that i had never heard before that she ca called she called it an ab reaction like i think that's the word she uses um, and it's sort of like a, you know, a memory along with like some sort of like physical upheaval or sensation. Right. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, so some of that, um, but also like that, but when I have memories, like a lot of the, the ones that I think are memories, it's me as a, a younger person. It's not like in any way in like my, my age now or in the state that I'm in now. Yeah. Um, so I have like, I, it's, you know, but some of this stuff is so hard. Like it's such a, the dreams are such a weird space for me. And also I don't sleep well. So I don't spend a lot of time. I don't get many hours in that REM state. Um, so it's just almost like grasping at things. So there, that those, so, you know, we have the, or, the quote unquote organic dreams that are just sometimes like, like I had one last night that was like so weird. It was like, I was at like some kind of street party and then this is going to sound so stupid because I never dream of anything like this, but literally all of a sudden there was a dinosaur running at me. Right. Like I was like, I don't, I, I can't, I mean, I don't think about dinosaurs at all. It's not something part of my, you know what I mean? I was like literally at like some kind of street gathering or like, it felt like some type part inside and part outside. And then all of a sudden I look over and there's a, I, like it was the stupid, like it was, it's so stupid, but I'm like, that's weird. And to me, that seems like, um, just a weird dream. You know what I mean? What, can you tell us more about that dream? Do you have so, more of it? So it was, I was basically felt like I was at a party where at one time, like I was going like from one part of the party that was on one side of the street and one side of the part one. And then it wasn't like a dance music kind of party. Really. It was more like an outdoor, almost like a festival or a parade kind of party or something, which is weird. Uh, I don't really go too much to those kinds of things, you know? And I was on one side of the street and like, I felt like sometimes people were in costumes and on the other side of the street, not and, like part of it was sort of inside and part of it was outside. 
And then all of a sudden I just looked and I was like, watch out, Stegosaurus. <laughs> it was the weird, like, what the hell is that? You know what I oh, mean? That's like, interesting. Yeah, because it is a total anomaly from the rest of the dream. Total anomaly. And also I can't, not something I, I think about really. You know what I mean? Like my nephew likes dinosaurs, but like he was here last week, but like he's a, like dinosaur. It was just weird, right? Like, I don't know. So to those, I tend to just think of like, that's just a weird mishmash of different things that have come up over the last couple of weeks in your life. And they're organizing themselves strangely into a, you know what I mean? Um, into something. And then, you know, the into synchronicities that, probably. Yeah. Yeah. And then the ones that I was describing before where it's like memories being returned, like sometimes it's like weird stuff. Like, okay, like you know, um, sometimes like, you know, these can be memories of, um, well, they can be memories of certain kinds of abuse or they can be memories of good times. And sometimes the two things show up in the same dream, which is really, really interesting. Um, you know, like I had like a recent dream where there was like some memories of certain kind of abuse, but then there was also memories of having a good time at sleepover parties from people I used to do with people I used to do gymnastics with. Okay. Does that mean, well, maybe there was some of this abuse was going on at these sleepover parties. You know what right. I mean? That would be, I mean, I could see someone maybe making that connection. Right. Certainly. Yeah. And so, like, you know what I mean? And some of the things that came up for me in the days following um, were enough to make me go, okay, there's something here that I really need to look at, you know? Mm -hmm. um, one of the, you know, so there's those. And then there's dreams, like, and there's dreams that I would call, um, for lack of a better term, cloning center dreams, right? Mm -hmm. And this is the dream. And these, I started to become really, really aware of these, like, in the like maybe two years before I came out and started talking about any of my experiences and it, they would be so weird, but it would be like, um, you know, and, and even though there are some problems with the way he puts material out for, to on a certain level, Donald Marshall did a really good job of describing some of these things that go on in the cloning centers. Um, his is a little bit more focused on like celebrities and, and himself and like, you know, being involved with that. Um, than my experience of it is, you know, but I can't say none of that exists. Like one of the strangest ones that I ever had was, um, and this also, this dream also made me start to look back at certain kinds of dreams I'd had my whole life and wonder what they were. But this particular dream I had, I was like doing gymnastics and I was being judged Mm -hmm. And like I, but I was doing gymnastics now as the, at my age, but this was like maybe five, three or four years ago. So I was already like in my late thirties. Mm -hmm. I was like doing gymnastics and being judged. And like, there was some people there that I recognized from my own life. And then there was others that I didn't. And it was like, people were watching and it was like, um, it, but it felt like, um, not like it felt in some weird way gratuitous like like it felt like it wasn't like oh watching just because enjoying watching gymnastics or a competition it felt <laughs> right. like there was some weird situation going on and like one of the people who was judging i recognized as an old coach of mine that was kind of a weird guy and then the other there was other people that i didn't know and then the strangest thing happened like a few weeks later i was at my sister's house and she was we were watching chopped that show on cooking channel, which is not something I don't, I don't watch TV and I'd never watched chop before. And one of the people who was one of the judges on chopped, I recognized him from the dream. Oh, wow. It's this guy Scott Conant, Scott mm -hmm. Conant. He's a regular judge on chop. I had never seen him before. Like, I'd never seen the TV show before. I'd never heard his name, but when I saw him, I was like, Oh my God, that's the guy from that, that weird, you know, I, I called him. Yes. Games, they happen at night. But one yeah. of the things that was, with this dream was that I couldn't get my body to function properly. It was like, so I, how I understand for my, how I myself understand the whole thing with the cloning is what it is really is they're basically at night while you're sleeping, it's a way of abducting you without taking you out of your house or out of your bed. Right. They're basically like driving your consciousness out of your body and into like a clone body, you know, basically. And um, so it would make sense that, I was having trouble getting the body to function, right? Mm -hmm. Like, right. I, I'm, it's not coordinated. And I even had like, it's, you know, it's like, it was almost like, I mean, I could do the stuff, but it was like, felt really uncoordinated. And it reminded me that oh, from the time I was little, I used to have all of these dreams that I, cause I was a gymnast and it was a big part of my life. But usually most kids, when they have the dreams of gymnastics, or the dreams of the thing that they're better than they, they were in real life, right? Like they're doing amazing things they could never do. 
in all of my dreams, it was always that I couldn't get my body to work right, which makes me wonder if that was something that had been going on with me, if I'd had like a whole other sort of gymnastics career at night where they were sort of experimenting with this sort of clone body thing. I don't know any of this for sure. I have no evidence or proof of all of any of this, but <laughs> you know, that's kind of the nature of this thing. I don't care or expect anyone to necessarily believe me, but there's no but, other but on this, Emily, on yeah. this, does any of this, did any of it feel like you were like, you know, the lucid, hashtag or that conscious where you were you know hyper conscious like you are now yeah like so, like i mean yeah like sometimes it was like very um you know i was doing um like my regular stuff my regular yeah. routine, but i couldn't get my body to work right it was almost like trying to write with your left hand yes. or if you're a pc person and you switch to mac and it feels retarded or if you have you know what I mean? Like if you're have one one arm in a cast and you're forced forced to try and do everything, it was like that. And it was like, but it was always with people watching, right? It was always with people watching. That's, yeah, very interesting. And it was always like it. It always felt almost like um, like I had like attachments to my body that didn't feel like you know what I mean. Like it was just so weird, and it just makes me you know when I had this dream as an adult that was like it was a much, it was, it was kind of a different scenario or situation than the ones I remember from when I was younger. Mm -hmm. But that feeling of not being able to work my body, you know, like I just made me start to wonder about all the dreams that I had about that kind of stuff as a kid. Cause I did, there were a lot of those, like we were talking, you know, I didn't have lots of memories of, of specific dreams, but I remember, uh, I mean, it was a regular thing of these dreams where I was doing gymnastics and I couldn't, like, I just couldn't, Everything was slow. It felt retarded. I didn't feel. Mm -hmm. Imagine if you had your own brain, because you, you, we have muscle memory and we also have in our, you know, we have to use our brain to do these skills too. A lot of things we do in gymnastics are really hard. And like your brain knows what to do. And so it's cueing your body, but it's not, your body's not responding in the way you're used to it responding. Right. Yeah. I, I never had dreams, never ever had dreams where I could do fantastical things that I couldn't do in real life. Only. Oh, that's, that's interesting. Yeah. That's very interesting. Yeah. What about, okay, so, and, and then the, just to tag back onto this, um, astral projection, I know we've been talking about this a bit. You seem to be in touch with, um, I keep calling it that psychic sense, and you give me a million examples of how really in touch you are. Um, but what about like astral projection and out of the body stuff that, yeah. that is, that feels completely different from these experiences that you're kind of describing right now? Yeah. So like I, I would consider so that some of the flying and uh, underwater dreams I had when I was little, mm -hmm. um, those felt more like that. Um, again, with some of the things I know now, I wonder, but I used to have these flying dreams that were like, I could fly. Like I could really, and they weren't like when other kids would tell me their flying dreams, it would just be like, Oh, I was soaring high above the whatever. No, this, I had to work. This was work. <laughs> but like I could fly, like it was like literally, it was basically, it was almost more like, like you, I could not stop. My, if you stopped, if you, like as long as I kept moving, I could fly. But if you stopped or tried to rest for a second, yeah. So this is I, visceral. Yeah. This is physical. Totally physical. It was yeah. hard work. It it was fun, but it was hard work. It was not like oh look at the bird soaring. You know what right. I mean? Right. Mm -hmm. So it was that, and then um, the, the 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 more underwater ones were just basically like. Um, like, like it was more like swimming through the air. Like there was water in the air. So like the swimming dreams, the underwater dreams and the flying dreams were very similar. It was just like, sometimes it felt like there was water and sometimes it felt like there wasn't, but the motions were kind of the same. It was almost like doing the butterfly is swimming. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. It's kind of like the flying motion. Um, and then also like going in like deep areas of, of, an ocean or whatever and sometimes through like you know those like underwater caves and caverns and things like that some of those i'm not sure that those were necessarily dreams because i also have like a large amount of um what i call like underwater breathing memories mm -hmm. uh, you know what i mean and so there's some crossover between the dreams and the memories but the, like whatever they are it's so visceral that to this day anytime i, I so i have memories of um, being trained to breathe underwater while sitting on the bottom of a swimming pool. <laughs> yes. And, and to this day, 
without thinking about it, anytime I get in a swimming pool, I immediately go down and try and sit on the bottom of the pool and see if I can breathe. Mm-hmm. And, and it's like, I can't do it. Like I can't breathe underwater, but everything in my body thinks I'm going to. Yes. It's not, uh, I'm, intriguing. it's not like, I'm going to go down and try and breathe. It's like, I just am down there and I'm like expecting to breathe. And then I realize I'm oh, like, <laughs> not, um, you know what I mean? But, uh, um, yeah. So the, the, the memories aren't so much of like deep spaces in the ocean or, or underwater caverns or whatever. The memories are much more um, like um, training scenarios. Like, you know what I mean? Um, and some of them I actually have, like, they're not so foggy. Some of them are fairly real, like fairly clear memories um, of being like underwater for tremendously long periods of time. Mm-hmm. And, um, and then the sitting on the, like, I, I, there was this summer camp and I've, I've spoken about this before in the show. There was a summer camp I went to and some of this went on there. Like I would sometimes be separated from the other kids and taken to this pool that was like behind a house that was on the same grounds as a summer camp. And sometimes it would just be me or sometimes there would be one other kid. And the way that they would get me to do it was basically because I always like the main pool that the other kids swim in that I swim in sometimes too was a big Olympic sized pool with like a one meter and a three meter diving board. And mm-hmm. because I was a gymnast, I could do like a lot of flips and I was kind of a show off. I like to show off. And so I like to do that when we had our swimming period. But the way they would sort of coax me away from that and get me to go to this smaller swimming pool was that I was pretty small. So I actually had a hard time bouncing those big diving boards. And this little pool had a really small diving board that was really bouncy. So I could do like really cool tricks, like better tricks off of it. And even though nobody was watching, it was fun to do those tricks. So I would go because I could use the bouncy diving board. But what would happen there was I would do this thing sitting on the bottom of the swimming pool. Like I would go down and it would tell me to be like, it was almost like get really like still and quiet. And like, you have to really, really relax. And then you could stay down there for a long time. And I remember and I've heard, I've had some conversations with other people who have some similar memories, but I remember them telling you, you couldn't hold your breath. If you held your breath while you were doing it, it wouldn't work. Because I think, I think what the point was, was to get your body in such a relaxed state that you actually could almost begin to breathe through the skin. Mm-hmm. Um, and so there would be that. And then there would also be this other exercise where, you know, those games you used to play when you were little, where like, you'd have like five rings or things you'd throw down at the bottom of the pool and you'd go down and catch them, the red one, yeah. the blue one. Yeah, well, yeah. There would be, they would do that with me, but there would be like 50 or 75 rings and I had to get them all before I could come up. It wasn't just like a few, right? Mm-hmm. So I would be down there for minutes. You know what I mean? Cause they'd be all over. And I, you know, I remember like you have to get them in the certain orders. I think some of them had numbers on them and they wanted me to collect them in order. You know what I mean? And things like that. And I think, and this is just me supposing here, but if you are focused on remembering what order, what number is supposed to be next or what order the color is, you won't actually be thinking about the fact that you're not having air. And so you're focused on yes. something that allows you to either like, you know, somehow do something in your body that expands your capacity to, you know, your, like whatever oxygen is in there works for longer or this thing where you start to breathe through the skin or something, something else is going on because it would like it, the longer I was under there, it seemed to get easier. Yeah. That's, yeah. those are intriguing. And so in these experiences, you were as conscious as you are now. They're conscious experiences. Those, yet the, they- those, those, the bottom of the swimming pool and the, the rings. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Where do you think? Okay. So, what do you think consciousness is? Where does it live? Um, so I think it. Ha- I think our con- the main portion of our consciousness resides outside of whatever this c- containment system or simulation we're in is. I think it resides out there with our highest self, mm-hmm. and our brain it, it, here is some kind. Of, our brain, or is our is it our third eye? Or is it some, or whatever, like there's some sort of connection, some sort of tether, some sort of receiver, right? That um, we are always have some level of contact. And I think um, when we are in certain states, like for me, when I'm uh, exercising, like I go on very long runs. And when you get like the right and the left side of your brain working at the same time and you get into a rhythm, also when I'm dancing, this makes this basically like opens up a more direct connection where you can actually whole information from that consciousness that resides um, outside. And you can kind of have so, back and forth with it. 
so okay and then let's so let's move into like let's move into death okay what what goes on with that what what do you see that as you know wow. what? so yeah i don't like i don't know like i i you know i definitely um so this has been a, an interesting year for me as far as that because I, I lost a very very dear friend um under difficult circumstances with that and so I'm probably like in a review period of my life about what I think death is. This is a I good time happens. to talk about it then. Yeah. So I don't know. Like, I don't, like, I don't, you know, um, I've heard, used to listen to someone who said that all deaths were actually suicide. That, you know, basically like you decide when you're done and then you're out. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, so I don't know if that's the case. I, I don't know if I have fear of death. I have, maybe I have fear of like a long or a painful death. But yeah. not if it happened quickly, like, I don't know, you know, like, I don't know. Like, I don't know if it's just like when we die, we're just like pop, going to pop back out on the other side where our consciousness has been lying and be like, okay, I escaped the game. You know what I mean? Like, I yeah. don't know if that's what's going to happen. I don't know. I mean, I used to have some of these ideas that like, you know, we all, as we make our way through this information traps and loops and whatever, you know, are they taking us to the other side of the moon and uh, erasing our memories and sending us back? Um, are we, is it, should we go towards the light? Should we not go towards the light? Like, you know, these are all things I've considered. I don't know. I don't actually think it's going to be like that when you die though. Um, I, I, I don't know. I often wonder, I, one of the things I've been considering lately is if the memory wipe doesn't, it's not, doesn't happen when you die. It happens when you're about to come back in, that the birthing process is so traumatic that you come back in with memories and with purpose. And you're like, I'm going to go here. I'm going to go back. I see this is the body I want. This is the, the, you pick, you choose sort of your life and you have all these ideas about, okay, I have all this information and knowledge and, and whatever from the last one. And I, I'm going to use it. I'm going to put it to work. And then something about the entry process is so traumatic, so difficult that, that you spend the rest of your life after that, trying to remember what you came here for. What if, what if death is, is similar to that though, the, on this end of it, you know, what if it's similar to, pushing through the, you know, maybe it's yeah. the same gate. Yeah. It, it's, it's, enti it's entirely, I mean, maybe what we're just continually doing is going through different gates to different stages of awareness or different levels of, of consciousness, reality, whatever. That certainly um, is a possibility. I mean, maybe like nothing, maybe when you die, nothing changes except for you're out of this physical body in this physical containment. And now you're just somewhere else with the same, Thoughts, consciousness, idea. I don't know. Um, it, 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 it is super interesting. I think um, some of the report, I, I remember listening for a while to like a guy who was, a, um, I think he was an, an anesthesiologist and mm -hmm. he ended up becoming really, really interesting and interested in where it was that people were going while they were having surgeries. And eventually he stopped being an, an anesthesiologist and just started um, trying to you know, figure that out and became kind of a researcher in that area. And some of the things he was saying, like, like, is that, is it really, you're just gone. Like you're dead when you're out, when you're under, like, you know, when you're anesthetized, you're out and then you're back. You know what I mean? So is it like right. that? You don't come back when you, I don't know. Like it's very, um, you know, what, what do you think? Well, this is that, see, you need to interview me on a different show. <laughs> you're going to ask me. That's funny. Look, I mean, you made me crash my whole situation. Turn it on me, Emily. Um, I want to get, so also I want to cover, um, I do have a lot of thoughts on death though, and I have a lot to say about it. Um, but I'll, I'll do that later. Yeah. Um, what, what, so the, some of the stuff you were bringing here to me that I'm hearing, I almost didn't even want to get into this because I feel like I got, I feel like I know where you're coming from with this, but what do you think about deja vu? Yeah. So I, I have a lot of deja vus. Um, and, uh, I think that like, so uh, my thoughts on this, they evolve a lot, but I think that like, um, when you have a deja vu, it's like, we're in a reality that's just slightly out of phase with another reality where the same thing is happening and it just happened in the other reality. So when you're experiencing it now, it feels like, I think that like, there's many, many different versions of ourselves that are mm -hmm. mostly exactly the same as the one we are here, but just one or two little things different. And it, you know, that reality might actually just be like right next to us, not very far away. You know what I mean? And I think sometimes there's crossover 
And so sometimes we have a memory from um, uh, another now self, another, you know, like I, I don't, I don't necessarily think that past and future are different times. I think they're sort of parallel, like, you know what I mean? I think they're, I think all, all of the incarnations are now, they're just like slightly, slightly separated from each other, but connected, mm -hmm. you know? So I think sometimes, um, you know, or, or, you know, we, we're quantumly entangled. My friend Jeff says this, we're quantumly, quantumly entangled with all of our other incarnations. Um, and so, you know, if, if all the realities are sort of similar, just slight differences, then this, what happens now might remind you, you know, I think we're connected to our other selves. And I actually think that's what, that is what um, some of this cre alter creation is based on is tapping into the, our other selves from uh, other realities that, they, that whoever's running these programs knows that that exists and hides that from ever, they hide that from everybody else, but they tap into it and use it for their own benefit. And if we understand it, we can too. And I think deja vu is just evidence of that. So, so in that though, so in this fractal kind of experience yes. and then tying back again to death. So if one, one fragment dies, do, are they all dying? Is there like a collapse then? Is there, how would that work? I, you know, that's a really interesting question. I, and I don't, I think that, no, I don't necessarily think that, that if one dies, they all die, but I think you lose a part of yourself. Like, um, Randy and I have some really deep discussions sometimes. And he, like, he feels like he's had certain events in his life where he, you know, certainly one in particular where he almost died and maybe should have died, but he does feel like he lost a part of himself. So maybe when uh, that same thing happened in the next reality over and that version of him did die and that's the loss he's feeling. Um, so I don't know if, if one dies, if they all do, but I do think we, you know, I do think you would feel it. I do. Um, yeah. And maybe that's also, maybe you'd also actually even miss that other version of yourself, even though you're not totally consciously aware that it's there. Like mm -hmm. I've had this experience sometimes of missing someone that I don't even know who I'm missing, mm -hmm. but I just oh, feel yeah. the sense of loneliness for someone and I can't figure out who. And I so, think that a lot of us have that, Emily, actually. Yeah. I just remember one night I was walking on the treadmill and like, I'm just totally normal. I mean, I, I have sometimes strange things happen to me on the treadmill, which I think that's interesting because of your looping on the yeah, treadmill. Yeah, you're looping and you're, you're pushing and it, yeah, yeah, it's okay. repetitive. It's so I've had some interesting experiences on the treadmill with like time dilation and time displacement and different things like that. But this was just something totally different. I was just walking, everything was fine. And all of a sudden I had the, like the deepest sense of like sorrow and that like I missed somebody so bad that like my stomach hurt and I like bent, like I, I was bent over. I stopped and I bent over and it was like, I was really upset for like a few minutes and then it just went away and I just continued on on the treadmill. But it was such a profound and deep sense of like, of like missing something or someone. And it was so weird because I had no idea what, you know what I mean? Like, is that, um, you know, some connection with that part of the consciousness that resides outside of the simulation? And am I right. like, you know, or is that another version of me? Something, you know, like, is there some, I don't know, but I've, it is one of the most unusual and most mysterious feelings I've ever had. That's incredible, actually. And I, I feel like I can relate to it, not on the treadmill, but having been bombarded with intense emotion out of nowhere. Nowhere. Yeah. Yeah. I also sometimes have it. And it, like, it was a period of time in my life, particularly, I mean, I have it still, but it was so intense during this period of time when I was living in downtown Los Angeles. And I was at probably like what I would term the scariest point of this journey for me, because I was like almost coming. It was that scary part where like, I'm almost about to sort of push through. And so everything's trying to sort of, you know, go, hold you in that spot you know what I mean like you're afraid to talk about stuff and that's a dangerous time for yourself but I remember I used to walk around downtown and I would see like the homeless animals right mm -hmm. like people oh, like yeah. or the homeless people with yes. their animals and the amount the, the way I would feel like the, the level of emotion that I felt because I said we all know like it's upsetting when you see those commercials on tv or when you yeah. see people at the freeway exit this was far beyond that and it was this feeling of like that could be me. Like it, like, you know, like if this doesn't go right, if I'm not able to like escape the scenario that I'm in right now, like yes, me. And, yes. Like, and it was like this. Um, and like, what is, you know, I don't know. I, and it was, I, I felt it more with the animals than I did with necessarily the people, which sometimes made me feel bad, but like, I, I don't know, like that, I, I would just look at them and it would be just like the deepest, most overwhelming sense of sadness and despair. 
and like I, I almost to the point of un, of not of not being able to tolerate it. Like it almost made you know it would it would make me that upset. Um, and it's it was that same level of emotion that you're talking about, though. Yeah. Like you know, like almost um, like didn't necessarily make sense for the situation, but it was so real that I had to pay attention to it. Yes, absolutely, arrest you in a way. Yeah, yeah. It's uh, um, I can relate to with the uh, the animals over humans for the most part. I mean, there are certainly humans walking around that I I love, love, love their tribe, but animals always there's just a, something incredibly. I'm just tied into them. Like I'm nature, you know, yeah. like I am the roots and the mycelium and all that. Yeah, absolutely. Have yeah. you ever had any, any feedback that you sleep, talk or walk? Um, so I, um, I don't, I, I don't think I've had any feedback that I sleep, talk, uh, I sleep, walk, sorry. Other people around me, like, which is also interesting. Like there is a neighbor um, and in the house that I grew up in as a child and that I just actually recently moved out of, um, who was a sleepwalker and always was having sl- like sleepwalking dreams where he was coming to our house. He was like sleepwalking to our house and he would wake up usually <laughs> right before he rang our doorbell. And it was always about something related to me. Um, which oh, is interesting. interesting. Yeah. And, you know what I mean? And so there was definitely some interesting things going on in the area that I grew up in. So that, um, I thought that was interesting. Um, and and uh, my stepbrother and my uh, my uh, my ex stepmother, um, they used to sleep, walk, and eat. They would sleep, eat, like they would <laughs> go downstairs and eat, and but they'd be asleep. Like they'd be standing there in front of the refrigerator yes. eating, and you'd just like just get up and see and you talk to them, but they're not responding to you. But yes, just, and it, uh, the, the ex stepmother would would <laughs> things during the night that she never would eat in her waking time. You know what I mean? Yeah, that was interesting. But the sleep talking for sure. Um, like I've, but also uh, people said, yeah, I mumble a little bit when I was sleeping, nothing particular, but I used to be terrified that I would talk in my sleep. Um, and why were you terrified of that? I don't like, well, I, I became terrified after I had, so at one point in my like late, I guess it was my early twenties, um, a therapist hypnotized me or tried to hypnotize me. And I did not like that. And I mm. flipped out. And I was just like, and after that, like, I was always afraid that like people were going to try and get me to say things or do things. And I actually think that was like my, um, probably should have been the first clue to me that like that had been something that had gone on with me. And yes. I didn't like it. Absolutely. And yeah. So, yeah. So I think I was afraid, like, I, I think, you know, so I think, you know, I was afraid of that. Um, but uh, the, my sister, so with, one of the things that happens with the sleep paralysis is when I'm stuck like that, I will try to scream. And, yes. and, but so one time I was staying with my sister in Washington, DC for a couple of months and we were sleeping in the same room. And she said, it's so weird when you're sometimes in the morning before you wake up, you go like this. <clears throat> I'm like, no, it's cause I'm paralyzed and I am screaming at the top of my lungs, but yes. that's little tiny noise that's coming out. So yes. I told her, like, if you ever be doing that, wake me up. Um, but so, that and like sometimes I would try to talk like to if there were some if I knew somebody was in the room I would try and talk but nothing would come out. Um, I I I I still get that it, and it it can be yeah it's alarming it's alarming to me every time I still try to wander into it. Hold on a minute, uh, Jerry. If you'll do the questions, I actually have a situation going on. <laughs> Sure. <clears throat> what, what's left? Oh, she's gone. What was the last question? Yes, yeah. I was looking at chat. I'm sorry. Okay, we have questions from chat, people. Yeah, let's go for <clears throat> questions from chat. Awesome. Um, where did it go? Okay, sorry about that. I got it. Did you have more questions? No, I'm. I'm about where I want to be. I think. Um, yeah, I think. The only thing I think we didn't cover that I wanted to talk about was others in the dreamscape. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Is this something that you've, you gave it to us early on. So back in the, back when you're young at six, where you, you were having that experience and you knew you weren't alone. Right. So that was with the sleep paralysis. So yeah. So um, sometimes I have this, you know, um, very rarely, once in a while, there'll be someone from my real life that shows up in my dream. 
But I have a lot of these dreams, and some of these I would consider to be um, inserted dreams or synthetic dreams, um, where someone is trying to convince me that they're the person that I know, but it's not them. Right? So I have oh, like some trickery. Yeah. Like I get a lot of that kind of thing. Um, and uh, yeah. That every usually like very very sel- you know every once in a while there'll be where it's like someone who I identify as my father but it's not my father from this life or this real world or someone who I like identify as like supposed to be my you know friend or whatever but it, it, it's it's very unusual I don't get a lot of interaction with every once in a while I'll get something with people um, you know from my life and my dreams um, and I don't have the other thing that like I, I've never had. You know, a lot of people with the sleep paralysis, they, um, it seems to wind into like alien abduction dreams for them mm-hmm. or things like that. I've never had that. Like, I don't, to the best of my ability, I, to remember, I've never had any dreams about aliens or UFOs. I've never been abducted um, by, by aliens or UFOs in dreams or in my reality that I'm aware of. Um, but I do somehow know what the inside of a ship looks like. I think that might be from remote viewing the inside of one. Mm-hmm. But I've never had any of that, like, kind of, I've never had, um, I, yeah, I've, I've never, I, I, I have not had, like, a lot of alien action. But, but even though I'm aware that it's there, you know what I mean? Like, it's not something that's been, um, you know, I, I, like, I, it's, it's not, that's just not my thing. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> I, I have this, um, this is kind of something I'm starting to add in this, in the Nox Mente stuff. And, and I think it's a perfect, you're a perfect person to maybe enroll this with okay. is in the world around you. And, and it can go back to whatever, wherever, as far as you can remember, or, but just now, are you, when you interact with people and I know you say you do, you're out and you, ha- you interact with people. Are you ever treated strangely or is there any, is there any strangeness around you, Emily? Yeah, for sure. Um, so yeah. Yeah. I think that, like, I mean, I think I carry a very different um, energetic frequency and vibration field than most people do. Mm-hmm. And so some people lo- really like that and others are very put off by it. Um, and so I s- s- understand and sense that, but I've also had weird things happen. Like, Sometimes, like, people will come into my work. Like, I remember when I first started working at the restaurant that I work at now, maybe not first started, but a few months after, this very unusual couple that I would say are not, were not normal humans. Or uh-huh. humans. <laughs> yes. I don't mean that in a derogatory way. <laughs> no, but I think <laughs> most of us that get it, get that. They were very clearly there to sniff me out in some way. Mm-hmm. And they were, like, they were really nice, but they were so weird. Like, they were... They're, um, every, they were they're getting, everywhere. They were getting unusually close to me. And it was like they were not interested in any other person that was working in the restaurant, right? They just, they were just, the woman was telling me how wonderful I was and how interesting I mm-hmm. like, You just met me 37 seconds ago. Mm-hmm. And like, they're not interacting with any of the other people who work in the restaurant or anything like that. And they were just on me like flies on poop. You know what I mean? So I've had that happen. Um, things like that. I've had, uh, there was this one couple that used to come into my work that like, I'm a hundred percent certain were vampires Mm -hmm. and it was so unusual. Like they were interesting and I would chat with them, but at a certain point I had the recognition that they were vampires and then they never came back after that. I never said anything to them, but like they knew that I knew and then they didn't. But you saw them. Yeah, Yeah. absolutely. You know what I mean? They were nice and stuff, but I don't know if they were like actual vampires or just energetic vampires. And so once I was onto them, whatever they were trying to get at they were always wanting to come and talk to me sometimes they would come in like two or three days in a row um and then i've had um i re- just recently i had it and i was spoke about this a little bit um last time i was on with chris and sheree geo at the last party that i underground kind of party i went to this guy came started talking to me and like i had the recognition that he's what we've been terming an npc a non-player character yes yes and it was so like, but i think some of these npcs are trying to come to life and right and it it's was like very, they're getting more gigabytes or something i don't know well, he was very nice he was very sweet but it was so odd like he was <laughs> the eclipse it was almost it was like he was like yes. he was like talking to a 3 year old in a sense like he didn't know how to talk to me and he was asking me strange questions he wasn't creepy though he was asking me like 
you know, what's your name? But then he was like, what, where do you live? What street do you live on? Like, right. But it wasn't creepy. Like I didn't feel it was like, what I would ask, like when you were six and you met someone in your class and you're like, Oh, where do you live? Oh, I live on that street. It was kind of like that. And mm-hmm. it was almost like he wanted to touch me or smell me. And he was like trying to figure out how to talk to me. And he made some observations about my clothes that were like, seemed unusual and like, you know, he commented on my dancing, which people some often do, but he like, he, he was in, it was weird. Like he, he just didn't like, he was so sweet. He was very pretty, very blonde and blue eyes. And it was just like, this person is not yet fully sentient, but they're trying to become, they're trying to figure out how to become it, which made me actually like, it comes to the realization that with some of these people, we have this weird situation where you have people who are like, sentient and organic who are falling into like cyborg or clone or or yes non-player character states and then you have these other things that were that that seem to be trying to come online or trying to become awake or aware or whatever which makes me wonder did we come from that were we once like that was oh yeah you know Very so i good. have a new level of compassion for some of them depending i'll judge them individually based on their behavior and how they interact with me but this guy was very sweet and very harmless and he kept kind of coming back over and checking in with me throughout the night and whatever and you know he was very sweet and whatever but it was so like i just was like this is something unusual um, yes. and there's a lot of weird stuff at parties like I, there's a lot of weird all kinds of things there but um this was an interesting interaction so yeah i definitely have and you know i've had the stuff where like street lights turn off when i walk underneath them yes my father has always called me Hurricane Emily because he says, <laughs> well, I come in the room, that kind of stuff. So yeah, people respond to me like in different ways. And a lot, you know, like, one of the things I've had to come to terms with as I've uh, gotten more comfortable with myself is that some people just don't like me and that's okay. Yeah, you know, yeah, so yeah, absolutely. Out yeah. Do you, I, I'm, I totally overlooked this. And this is a significant question in, in your background bio. Were you brought up religious and did you change, shift? What are you, what do you consider it now? Yes. Yeah, so no. So I was raised really without any religion. My father's family is Jewish. My mother's family was like some denomination, like her mom was like a Christian scientist and her dad was something else. And there was no, um, we didn't go to church. I occasionally would like go to temple with my grandparents um, and whatnot. Um, you know, I'd say I have some like cultural Jewishness in me, but not any religious Jewishness, you know? Um, but one of the things that I did come to understand um, is that uh, Scientology has played a big part of my life, even though I'm not a Scientologist. So that hospital that I was born at that I told you is now the Church of Scientology. Um, you know, it's kind of a weird place that I was born at. And these things, like, they were running programs through certain places for certain reasons. They used certain kinds of buildings because of their geometry and the masonry and, and the geomancy kinds of stuff. Um, and, you know, so there's that connection to it. But I've also, like, you know, one of the, some of the people that act weird around me is whenever I walk by one of them Scientology places, they all start, like, they're on me, like, flies on <laughs> shit. But also, one of the things I noticed in my adult years is that whenever I move somewhere into a neighborhood within a month of my moving there, a Scientology center will open in the neighborhood. Oh, that's very strange. I to understand that Scientology is really um, involved, like really connected to the MK ultra stuff, to the promoting control programs and also to certain part aspects of um, targeted individual kinds of phenomena yeah. as, well as another cult. I consider Scientology to be a cult. Yeah, uh, as well as another cult called the Process Church of the Final Judgment, which yes. actually who were we just talking about that with? We had someone. Uh, I want to say it was Robert. It might have been. Um, so Dude. the Process Church, the Process Church, actually is connected to the Wizard of Oz and Wizard of Oz programming. And the yes. Process Church, some people consider it to be like a breakoff sect of Scientology. And there's like a lot of, uh, you know, one of the people who like, he's kind of an interesting guy in some ways and other ways I don't find him interesting, but there's a guy who has a, his name is Ed Opperman and he talks a lot. He's a private investigator and he talks a lot about the things that he's found that the process church people are connected to. And um, some of it is very interesting. And a lot of it has to do with stalking people in Hollywood and things like that. Well, there was a lot of um, psychedelics used in the process church too. A lot of psychedelics and, and yeah. a lot of the stuff that 
uh, if you pay attention to some of the things that have gone on in Scientology, and obviously L. Ron Hubbard used to work for the Central Intelligence Agency, and he was friends with Jack Parsons and Aleister Crowley and all these people that were um, really key in development of, of mind control kinds of programs. Yeah. L. Ron was um, uh, Naval Intelligence. Naval and, Intelligence. Right, yeah. and he, he and the CIA pretty much started the MK programs. Yes, yeah. and they had... They had safe houses in Los Angeles that were where some of the original Scientology groups also mm-hmm. started. It's the whole Laurel Canyon story, too, feeds into that. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. And the Laurel Canyon thing is interesting. Like, I used to hang out there some when I was a kid. Um, I had a friend who lived right across the street from Lookout Mountain Laboratory. Um, and uh, there's certainly connections between the underground dance scene in Los Angeles and Dave McGowan's work on Laurel Canyon, mm. for sure. Um, yeah, uh, Mark Devlin talks a lot about that. I've done some stuff with him. His new book, uh, Musical Truth 2, is coming out. There's a lot of stuff from me in there in the sections on dance music. Um, but uh, uh, the other thing with the Scientology, that I had this really interesting experience recently. I was driving to meet some friends for dinner, and I was coming like around the curve where Hollywood Boulevard and Sunset Boulevard come together. And I was stopped at the stoplight, and I looked up, and there was this billboard that I had never noticed before, this huge Scientology billboard that had the symbol, you know, that symbol they have with the two triangles with like the snake, the S. Yes, yes. <laughs> Somehow I had never seen that symbol before. Or like I, if I had, I wasn't aware of it. A caduceus? I at, yeah, I okay. looked at it. It gave me an instant, it grabbed onto my head, which tells me that it means something more to me. It's one of the symbols from my childhood. Literally, right. it felt like something grabbed onto my head right here. And it hurts so bad that I closed my eyes so that I wouldn't have to look at it anymore, but I couldn't. It was imprinted completely on the back. It wasn't just like a little bit on the back of my eyelids. It was imprinted there like I can't, I couldn't, I couldn't escape. Oh, wow. My yeah, that's open, programming. Right? And then I got to the restaurant. So the restaurant was like about a mile or two further down the road. And when I was sitting down, I was talking to my friend Danny um, and uh I was telling her this and she's like, oh my God. And Danny is a person that has been in my life on and off since I was a kid and, and whatever. She said, oh my God, someone else just texted me. Is this the picture you just saw? She's like, somebody else just told me that that happened to them. And one wow. of her other friends said that the same thing that they saw and they were like, what the fuck, dude? It makes uh, you think of like voice to skull, but image voice, to skull. That's exactly, you know? yeah. That's, you know what I mean? It was almost like whatever that snake was, like it's grabbed onto my head. Like, mm-hmm. so it just makes me wonder if that was some, if, if that sim- how prevalent and how important that symbol and the concepts around it were in early programming. You know what I mean? Cause the- yes. whatever it was yes. just grabbed right onto my head, you know what I mean? And it was just, it was, it was like super intense and it's, you know, like a- it stayed for a few minutes and then it kind of went away. Um, but it was so, so weird that I said it to her and she was just like, Oh my God, my- look, she showed me that the front, her friend had sent her the text literally like hours or maybe the day before. Um, so it was really weird. So, so yeah. what do you consider yourself now, like spiritually? What What are your views on so all I, that? So I used to be an atheist. I was like, I was raised with no religion. And I'd say for like most of my teen years and early adult years, I would have considered myself an atheist. And then maybe like, yeah, like, yeah, I, I was an atheist, probably actually into my 30s. And then I had, an, actually, I had an experience <laughs> in the psychedelic state. Um, I was at, I was at um, Coachella, and I was I ate mushrooms and I was dancing and Carl Cox <laughs> was on, and um, I couple so there was a, an experience within an experience like okay so like the thing that like I, I had this moment where I realized like, I was like I, I, I was tripping pretty hard and I had this moment where I was like I, so I was thinking a lot of my brother who had died just recently at that t- time. And very unexpectedly, and I was like really, really thinking about him, and I was thinking about him throughout the whole afternoon. And I just during the course of like the period of time, I, there was like a a few minutes where I experienced simultaneously like so much sadness and so much joy at the same time. Oh wow! Like, I understood that that was like what God was like mm-hmm. the ability to have both. Like I understood that that was why people like travel went, went to Lords and Mecca and places like that. Yes, they, yes. They, they were, whatever fervor they would get whipped into would make them feel that way. And whatever I was having that day, my level of emotion because I was still in a lot of trauma over what had happened with my brother, but I was enjoying myself with the music and a psychedelic thing. Like I just 
I felt, and I felt my brother's presence there and it was, you know, really weird. And then I had taken a picture, like at some point during, because you're in a, a tent there, like a big dance tent. I had like lifted my, it was like a Motorola flip phone. It was like back in that period of time. I just lifted it up like this and like it lifted it up and taken a picture of like the crowd, right? And after like things, at some point I went out to like get some air and whatever. And I looked at the picture I had taken and whatever I had gotten in the picture, like morphed, like it, it, it looked like my brother's face superimposed on the picture. And when I went home, I, I looked at it next to the picture of him from his funeral and it exactly was his face. Oh my. So like I had been having the experience where I was thinking about him. And one of the things that had happened, I was at Coachella's at the Empire Polo Field and down at, like in Indio. And mm -hmm. I had been there about seven or eight, nine years before in the same field with my brother at a rave at Nocturnal Wonderland. And people will laugh about this, but my brother had given me like a vial of acid to carry in because, you know, whatever this, and I was in my underwear and it broke. So like, I like super hard. Right? Oh my God. So, like, I, that had happened in like 1999 or 2000. And then I'm in the same spot on the same field, having this, this, this feeling of, you know, like I felt like he was there and whatever. And the, um, uh, Carl Cox played the, like, a, a techno remix of um, st uh, po the police or Sting, I Hope You Get My Message in a Bottle. Oh, wow. wow. And I was having that and I was thinking about him. And so like time collapsed and it was like, it was the, you know, I was right back where to then it was like this, it was just that whole afternoon was so crazy and, and, and like magical and whatever. And then I had a, a series of huh. unusual interactions with my brother after he died that just let me know that there was something else that it mm -hmm. was, you know, so I would say on a certain level, I'm still agnostic because I don't know what it is. Right. Uh, but I'm certainly not an atheist. And at this point I've had enough interaction with friends that I've lo lost, particularly this friend that I lost this summer. Um, and also enough interaction with other versions of myself, my future self, my past self, all intermingling, you know, uh, sort of intermingling in the, in the now that, um, no, I don't think, I, I, I don't think it's just, we're here, we're, you know, material and then we're gone. I don't, I don't. Yeah. Think yeah. I'm with you. Yeah. I'm agnostic like that too. I know something's going on. Yeah. <laughs> I don't yeah, know yeah. what, but something's going on. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I don't know if it's as simple as like, we're in some kind of containment system and avatars and we're outside of it. And so we're connected mm -hmm. to that or what it is like I don't I do think that God is something that is within you not something outside mm -hmm. of yourself yeah um, sometimes I, I'll get into interesting conversations with people who are religious about that and I'll ask them if they think it's something inside of you or outside of you and some of them have good responses to it and others look at me like I'm crazy um, but yeah no I think it's something inside of you and um, yeah like I don't I, I, I every I think all of the answers I think the universe is inside of you the answers are inside of you God is inside of you the other is inside of you that's and, back to Wizard of Oz right yeah all of the things that we like I don't know if this is humans nature or if it's what we've been programmed to do but this thing we do where we look outside of ourselves for everything is the yeah. real, is our problem like, you know what yeah I mean? that's the real fuckery yeah you know there's information out there but answers are only in here absolutely yeah. I think this is a good place to end this segment and open up to questions, and then we'll move into our post Horus show. Cool. All right. I have four questions that I've okay. selected from our wonderful studio audience. Hello, right. everyone. I'm not out there, obviously. Hello. <laughs> so the first one is from Mary. And Mary asks, when you're dreaming about gymnastics, do you get the feeling of being heavily weighted down, can't move fast, etc.? Some, um, yeah, sometimes it, it, I would say it's a little bit more of a feeling of uncoordination than it is about um, being heavy or weighted down. But I, I wouldn't say that there has never been any of that. Um, and yeah, and, and certainly like when I would have um, sleep paralysis, some of the feeling of not being able to move, it feels like there's weight on top of you. And so I can't remember well, like, I don't, and certainly not in recent memory, but I can't remember well enough from when I was younger if those dreams were in any way connected to the episodes of, of the paralysis. Um, and so that if, if, there, if there was weight on, in the dream and weight with the paralysis, those could be connected, but mostly uh, just not quite being fully coordinated more so than weight. Okay. Um, Suzanne wanted to know, where did you grow up? Um, I grew up in Los Angeles. 
Um, I still live here now. Uh, mm -hmm. I've lived all over the country at various times. I always end up back here. Um, I used to want to be away from here, and now I understand that this is Los Angeles is actually a huge part of who I am. Are you uh, like in LA or like Burbank or? I'm in the I'm in the Valley. I, I've lived. Okay. I've yeah. lived in. I've lived in downtown before. Like I had some of my yeah. really scary experiences when I was living downtown. I, I love Los Angeles in general. Like it's there's a lot of icky, gross, weird, very esoteric. I mean, this is where this is this is the belly of the beast. Los Angeles is the belly of the beast. Oh, definitely. Um, but there's also some really beautiful things here. Um, yeah, there's and, some great stuff in LA. And all of those things, all of the elements about Los Angeles are are elements about me. Like this, this there isn't. There's a reason why I was born here. You know what I mean? Um, and uh, I'm, you know, I, I, not that I'll, I, I'm probably sure I'll live other places during the course of my life, but I'll probably always end up back here. And um, I actually, at this point in my life, am really glad for this, even though it's challenging, being, you know, being a kid from Los Angeles, I'm actually really, um, I'm really glad that this is the experience I've had. All right. Very cool. Suzanne also wanted to know if your parents, if your dad was in the military or, or your mom or any um, connected military project, not projects, but <laughs> contractors, <laughs> sorry. So um, I don't actually come from a heavily military family openly or that I'm aware of mm -hmm. um, my mother. So I think some of my, some of my connection, like I, their connections come from both sides of my dad and how I ended up in the situation that, that I ended up in. Uh, my mom was involved in like a lot of Freemasonry for children kind of stuff, like Job's mm -hmm. daughters kinds of things. My mom's also pretty much a genius. Unfortunately, now she has dementia, and which is actually really interesting because sometimes I can get information out of her that I couldn't get out of her before. <laughs> but the, the the filter's a little down, mm -hmm. um, but she's very smart, um, and she uh, uh, was a financial analyst for Arco for Atlantic Richfield, like really well before too many women had positions like that. Mm -hmm. um, and she has some very interesting things that have gone on in her life. And then my dad, so. But are, are you RH negative? I don't know. My, I don't know my blood type. Damn it. That's going to have to be a new requirement for the show. <laughs> <laughs> your blood I type. Yeah, been, so it's in the notes. <laughs> I haven't There's been to the doctor in 20 years. So they won't, I, they I, won't do it. You have to pay separate. The insurance won't even cover it. They hide you that can shit. Get, you know you, you can, can get, get a, a blood. Yeah. You can get a kit. Yeah, uh, it's cheap. It's eight bucks. Maybe I'll do that yeah. yeah. Maybe I'll do that. It's on my, Amazon. My, my dad, though, like, so. <laughs> Post a link to that, I'm Jerry. doing it. I'm doing it. Um, I don't want to get myself in any trouble here, really, but I'm just going to say it. Like, my dad says he wasn't in the military, but there are some things that make me think maybe he was. Um, or maybe, he, I, I don't know. Like, it's, I, we get some interesting things in the mail sometimes, and my dad's a pretty interesting character. He mostly has been involved in academia. Mm -hmm. um, but that's also a complex of its own, you know, people, like, you know, there's other, I think we get so uh, used to looking at like military background with things like projects and programs, but there was also a lot of things being run through uh, academia, project talent was being run through athletic programs and smart kids schools and, you know what I mean? Stuff like that. But um, my dad's, in, my dad it was, you know, interesting, pretty much a world traveler really early on he was in the, he says he was in the merchant marines which i'm not 100 percent exactly clear on what that is um but uh and he also um you know did a lot of studying and, and schooling abroad from a you know that kind of thing but yeah no not a lot of military in my direct family okay okay let's see uh, merchant marines by the way are civilian mariners whatever so. that is <laughs> <laughs> they're not. They're not. They're not army marines. They're not. It's right. not the same thing. It's more like yeah. um, people who own boats. Yeah. All right. Uh, Jessica, the lovely and beautiful Jessica Melendez, asks: Did any of you ever had uh, you Emily? I've already answered. Had dreams of being killed or dying, and if so, how did you inter interrupt them? So I had dreams of being chased a lot. Like I felt like I was being chased or followed or whatever, but I don't think I've actually ever had dreams of dying. Okay. Um, fair, yeah. Fair enough. Fair enough. So cool. All right. Uh, last call on questions, people. <laughs> do do do. I forgot the the music again. 
Uh, Suzanne says her father, her grandfather was in the Merchant Marines. All right. Ah, all righty. Well, I'm surprised Suzanne didn't ask about, like, um, if there were Masons involved in Emily's. She already said there was. Sure. Yeah. So, yeah. Oh, okay. Those- yeah. I must have missed that. Hmm. So what? The, I'll say that, so my mom was in the Job's daughters, the Freemasonry stuff for children. Yes. Yep. Then, um, I one of the things I have noticed um, that everywhere I go, everything it's like important things that I do in my life. There's always a masonry like a, a, a mason masonry center, usually within a block or two, which I think is kind of interesting. Um, like from, near my work, near every you know what I mean. Like all where all my appointments are, there's always like a uh, like a mason or a freemason building or a freemason meeting center or whatever um and some of the areas that i spend a lot of time in are heavily uh, there's tons of like masonry stuff going on around there i think it's just part of los angeles is like where it's oh yeah. Masonry yeah kind of place yeah. um so yeah so some of my mom's family i don't know so much about my dad's family like yeah, he doesn't like. He doesn't really like to talk so much about some of this kind of stuff. You know, <laughs> that's so, dead giveaway. Yeah. He's into something funky. Yeah. So, <laughs> just say it. Just say it. Yeah. But I also, I'll say this: I I grew up at the corner of Devonshire and Mason. Oh, right. And so I, <laughs> of course I, you grew did. Up, I grew up at the corner of Devonshire and Mason. And when we had Andrew Bashago on the show, because he's from the same town in Los Angeles that I was from, from Chatsworth, and we have some similar experiences. We have different perceptions of what they mean, but we have a lot of same experiences. And he pointed. I had never realized. He's like. Yeah, the, the, basically, Chatsworth was named after Chatsworth House, which is in Devonshire, England. And so that's why Chatsworth is on the intersection of Devonshire and Mason in Los Angeles. Mm. Excellent. And that he used to work at a, he was telling me that he used to work at a gas station that's right there. And that Ian Rand used to come in there and like pester him about things. And it's very interesting because I was like super obsessed with Ian Rand, like in my junior high and high school years. And there's some very interesting symbolic stuff in a lot of her work. And apparently she lived in Chatsworth around the corner from me, which I did not know. Um, I thought that was interesting when he told me that. So, yeah. That's what's always cool about L.A. and New York, you know, is that you, yeah. you're in contact with you know, people are there that are recognizable all over. All over the place. I see them every day. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. When I lived in Burbank, I, w- I felt like I saw Jack Nicholson every day. <laughs> right. <laughs> <It's> like- <laughs> yeah. I see. I see. Uh, Travis from uh, Blink One Eighty Two and Rob Schneider from uh, almost every single day at the market. They go to the, the same Blink One Eighty Two thing. Isn't that what's his name? Yeah, band? You gotta ask yeah. that dude what what Tom DeLonge's been smoking. Oh, right? <laughs> Tom, did you see how it was? He was so awful on the Joe Rogan show. It was embarrassing. Did you see that? No, I have not seen it yet. Oh, go! Like it's so it's so uncomfortable. Like it's it's humor. It's it, it's so bad. Go to oh, I love yeah. watching the uncomfortable. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> on the to do list. Watch, Is this uh, on the questions? That's all I'm going to read. I'm ending this. <laughs> Thank you, everyone, for joining us. Uh, yes. Next week's guest is Steve Crimmy, author of The Kabotic Wind. I put a link in the chat to uh, his discussion on the book launch. And uh, if you guys have any suggestions for guests, please put them in the comments and we'll get them up. But we're booked up until April now. So thank you thank so you much. Thank you very much, everyone yeah, in the chat. I'm sending my love. Emily, other than the Off Planet and Media Emily. links <laughs> that I put into the description, do you have anything to plug or talk about? Or No, just, we're, you know, so we're, um, we do our show pretty much. Uh, every every week on Off Planet Radio, we have some new cons, new secondary shows that we're going to be coming out uh, with this year. Um, the one of them will definitely be a health show from an um, uh, alchemical perspective. Oh, nice! And, uh, then we have two or three other things we'll be rolling out a little bit later uh, in the year. And um, yeah, so come check us out at OffPlanetRadio.com or on YouTube at Off Planet Media. And uh, our Patreon is Patreon forward slash Off Planet Media. Thank you, Emily, for this wonderful show. Yeah, thanks Thank so much. Thank you. I really enjoyed this. And stay on. We're doing our post show. I will. All right. All right thanks, everyone. We'll see you next week. Bye.